Welcome to the Hallenstein Center's new online program, Lunch and Learn. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney. During the quarantine, we may not be able to journey beyond our homes, but that should not stop us from journeying beyond our minds. Today's journey takes us deep into the conflicts of the 20th century to one of the most fascinating Michiganders you probably haven't heard of. Our guide is Hank Meyer. You've met Hank shopping at the Meyer stores that he's executive chairman of. He joined the family retail business at age 11 as a grocery clerk. After serving as a reporter for a Detroit area suburban newspaper group, he became editor and later publisher of a weekly newspaper in Plymouth, Michigan. He rejoined Meyer in 1979 as assistant advertising director. He is the author of biographies of Senator Arthur Vandenberg and of his grandfather, Hendrik Meyer. Hank is also a Hallenstein scholar, I'm proud to say, here at Grand Valley State University. My conversation with Hank will go, oh, 20 to 30 minutes, followed by questions from our viewers. Our goal is not to go longer than about 45 minutes in all. So feel free to begin sending your questions to us right away using the Zoom toolbar to do so. Hank, thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be with you, Gleaves. This is delightful. Thank you. Well, who was Frank Murphy? And tell us something about his life and career. Well, I'm just beginning to learn that myself. But Frank Murphy was the, is the only Michiganian ever to serve on the United States Supreme Court. But he was born in Harbor Beach, Michigan, in the Thumb on Lake Huron in, in 1890. Um, served in World War I, graduated from law school at the University of Michigan and then was in his early 30s elected to recorder's court judge in Detroit, where he, he challenged an old guard, a corrupt old guard, to become a judge in the, in the Detroit criminal courts, uh, where he made a name for himself presiding over one of the most controversial trials in an early civil rights case in the 1920s, uh, when, a, when a, uh, an African-American dentist named Ocean Sweet who bought a house in a white neighborhood in Detroit, uh, found himself surrounded by uh, white protesters who wanted to get him out of the house and were threatening violence. Uh, a shot was fired from the house where he and his family were, were hiding and he was put on trial for murder. And uh, uh, Frank Murphy presided over that trial. Uh, he, the suite was defended by Clarence Darrow who saw in Murphy, as did the African-American press of the time, um, a, a real hero and champion of civil rights for African-Americans. So that was in his early 30s, but he, he went from recorder's court judge to become mayor of Detroit just after the stock market crash. This is in 1930. And in 1931, as mayor of Detroit, created what some call the Little New Deal. It was really before Franklin Roosevelt's election, he was implementing many of the public welfare efforts that we would later come to associate with the New Deal in Detroit. Uh, he, after he left the, the mayor's office, he was appointed by Roosevelt, to whom, to whom he became an ally and, and friend, uh, to be United States High Commissioner to the Philippines. Uh, served there for three years, helping groom the Philippines for independence, and then came back to run for governor in 1936, was elected governor of Michigan, just in time to preside over the sit-down strikes in Flint, where his, by calling out the National Guard, but not having the Guard evict strikers from the GM plant in, um, in Flint, he gave strength to the United Auto Workers efforts and um, was viewed as a champion of labor. Uh, but that also cost him re-election in 1938 because many saw that he thought that he was not sensitive enough, enough to the property rights of, that were being um, uh, violated by the sit-down strikers. He, was, he lost bid for re-election and Roosevelt then in 1939 appointed him as attorney general. And Went, held that cabinet post for a year before he was appointed by Roosevelt to the Supreme Court in 1940. And then he died in 1949 at the very young age of 59. Mm. Well, what a fascinating character. How did you become interested in him? 
he's uh, you had you were kind enough to mention that I had written a biography of Arthur Vandenberg and Vandenberg and Murphy, one a Republican, the other a Democrat, um, were had grew up in a parallel period in Michigan and United States history, and so um, I was a somewhat aware of Murphy from that and from my own history studies. Um, when I was researching Vandenberg at the University of Michigan's Mentley Library, um, the principal biographer of Frank Murphy, a historian from the University of Michigan named Sidney Fine, was still doing some of his Murphy-related research in the 1990s. And so, um, after he published his books, but he was doing some follow-up work. And so he and I became acquainted then. Um, and so I was, I was aware of Murphy um, right along, but, but my, my, he piqued my interest when I was talking about him with Sidney Fine, and then as I was reading about him in conjunction with Vandenberg. Okay, so I'm curious about his personality. What kind of person would he have been like to sit next to at a dinner party, say? Uh, tell us about his personality. He was, um, he was a teetotaler, so he wouldn't have shared the wine with you at the dinner party, although one of his fellow Supreme Court justices said that, that, that um, being in the presence of others who were enjoying a drink did seem to loosen him up. But he was, um, he was actually rather sought after as a dinner companion in Washington. One of his close friends there was the legendary Washington hostess, Evelyn Walsh McLean of Hope Diamond fame. In fact, he became her executor and godparent to two of her grandchildren. Um, so he would have been a rather sparkling character. Um, one of Franklin Roosevelt's cousins, a, a, a lady named Daisy Suckley, who was a, a um, a, a rather shy character, wrote in her diary, she hesitated to meet him because he had a reputation as such a ladies' man, but when she finally did, she found that he could talk on any number of, com of, of topics, and she found him quite charming. Um, he would have been, um, if you got him on a certain topic, he would have fallen to preaching very quickly because he was a passionate advocate for civil rights and civil liberties, and had a rather um, um, ministerial demeanor in many ways, but he also had a puckish sense of humor, and um, I think he would have been a rather sparkling dinner companion. So you say from his association with Roosevelt, uh, the ways he was appointed and nominated to various positions, I assume he was a Democrat, but was he a Democrat always? His whole life? He was. His, his father, who was a lawyer in Harbor Beach, uh, had, was a lifelong Democrat, and, and he grew up in a Democratic household. Um, the mayor, the, the office of mayor of Detroit was nonpartisan, and so um, he actually, his, one of his first opponents was an active Republican who um, made much of his partisan ties when Michigan and Detroit were still largely Republican, and Murphy challenged and chastised him for violating the, the spirit of a nonpartisan election. Uh, so in Detroit, he was nonpartisan, but as, as governor and for the rest of his life, he thought of himself very much as a Democrat. Interesting. So how did he get along with Republicans? I mean, for example, what was his relationship with Senator Vandenberg? Well, it was, it, it was cordial, not close, but it was interesting because he was, so he'd been mayor of Detroit, then he's appointed high commissioner in the Philippines, where he's really presiding over America's largest colonial possession um, in the early 1930s. Vandenberg was up for re-election in 1934, when Roosevelt was at the height of his popularity, and Democrats really wanted to beat Vandenberg, and they were begging Murphy to come back from Manila and run for the Senate against Vandenberg. Um, Murphy did some polling and thought it was going to be closer than he suspected, and he really enjoyed his role as this sort of proconsul of of American interests in the Philippines. So he really didn't want to risk that to come back and challenge Vandenberg. And Vandenberg has this delightful note that he sends to Murphy after Murphy makes that decision 
congratulating him on his wisdom and thanking him so much for the wonderful job he's doing in the Philippines and how 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 statesmanlike it is of him not to come back and challenge Vandenberg because Vandenberg won by the skin of his teeth and Murphy probably would have beaten him. And then, um, and they disagreed. I mean, Vandenberg was not, uh, did not approve of Murphy's handling of the sit-down strike in Flint. And um, they clearly were, were partisans on both sides of the aisle. And of course, uh, Murphy is a, is a Roosevelt, close Roosevelt ally. And Vandenberg is for many years in the New Deal, one of Roosevelt's greatest nemeses. But um, when Roosevelt, talk about how times have changed, when Roosevelt appointed Murphy to the Supreme Court, um, not only were there no hearings, but his nomination was approved by voice vote with Vandenberg eagerly chiming in and praising him. Of course, Vandenberg may have been glad to have Murphy off the scene as well, <laughs> once again, but um, they, their, their relationship was distant but very friendly. Well, I talk about the good old days when Democrats and Republicans could actually contend with one another, but got along behind the scenes. Indeed. In fact, uh, I think there, were, there was more contention when Murphy went to the Supreme Court with some of his fellow Roosevelt appointees. It was um, a book that I've not read yet, and I'm so early in my research, it's, it's fun to talk about it with this group. But um, a lot of people on this call may know a lot more about Murphy than I do, but there was a book called Scorpions written several years ago about that Roosevelt court and these powerful personalities that um, sometimes found themselves greatly at odds on, on big issues. Well, now let's go back a little bit before he served on the court. So he served as mayor of Detroit during the first years of the Great Depression. From what you've learned, Hank, how would you grade his performance as mayor at a really tough time in our nation's history? I think is overall in a very, very difficult circumstance, um, my impression is he did very well. He, he, he was, and of course, Roosevelt talked about this when he was first elected as well, and it proved untenable, but Murphy really liked the idea of a balanced budget. And so he, he went into the depression saying, we've got to help people. We can't have people starving in Detroit. And of course, Detroit, had the highest unemployment, the fastest of any major city in the US after the stock market crash. And so he was facing really severe challenges. And he, he both worked with private industry, but also funded by taxpayer money, um, was providing public assistance to, to a lot of Detroiters who were faced with very tough times. And eventually he discovered that, that it was not, that the budget would not sustain this because tax revenue is dropping at the same time that that unemployment is rising. Um, and so had to go into debt, had all kinds of challenges with, with bondholders and um, trying to get um, to borrow it, um, became a real, real tough challenge. But I think he handled it as well as anyone preventing the kind of unrest that could have taken place in such a difficult situation. Um, in, and part of that also was he, he was a, a civil libertarian throughout his life. And this was a time when the, the unions, including the UAW, had, had strong communist presence. And he was allowing demonstrations uh, to occur in the city that a lot, of, a lot of people, Republicans, of course, but a lot of conservatives say, you know, you can't tolerate all of this all of these demonstrations by these socialists and these communists. And he view it, viewed it not only as a right of free speech, but also as a way that people needed a chance to, to, to let off steam and express their opinions. This was not a time to, to suppress dissent. And, uh, and in fact, the, the Detroit Common Council um, was more conservative than their mayor and upset with his willingness to designate, he, he envisioned areas of Detroit, sort of like Hyde Park in London, where people could gather and, and anybody could get up and preach on any topic. And that didn't sit well with a lot, of his, a lot of the politicians in Detroit. And so when he wanted to designate certain park space to do that, one of the places the Common Council designated was right below his window outside City Hall. So he'd have to put up with the, 
with the with the with whatever ruckus ensued. Oh gosh, what a brave public servant! Well, then, after serving as mayor of Detroit, he has this interesting assignment overseas. Tell us more about that. He went to the Philippines with with um, no background of in, in international experience, other than having, of course, served overseas in World War One. But it was interesting, and, and again, I've got so much to learn. But there was a there's a there was a professor at the University of Michigan named Hayden, who was one of the leading American academic experts on the Philippines, and who had also been Murphy's law professor. And he tended to he actually uh, when Murphy was judge and then mayor, Hayden regarded him. Murphy had been a very indifferent student. He'd been active in campus politics and, and uh, um, student affairs, student life, but he'd been a very indifferent law student. And Hayden is sort of scornful about um, Murphy's credentials, but then Murphy invites him to come with him to the Philippines to serve as one of his aides, and so, which I think is a real tribute to Murphy's willingness to say, you know, um, I can overcome his, his suspicions and criticism of me because he's a, a store of knowledge I want to draw on. And, but he went to the Philippines uh, really um, as, as someone committed to Philippine independence. And this was a time when the U.S. had given, I don't want to say more than given lip service, but had been talking for ever since we would taken over the Philippines in the Spanish-American War about when the Filipinos would be ready for independence. And Murphy was committed to making that work and so pushed the Filipinos to, to ratify the, the Philippine legislature to ratify a constitution. And actually during his tenure there, went from being governor general to high commissioner. As high commissioner, that meant he was beginning to share power with the elected president of the Philippines who would guide Manuel Quezon, who would guide them toward independence. Um, so he, he really won the respect of the Philippine people, uh, supported women's suffrage in the Philippines, which he was very proud of, and, um, and had some fascinating experiences there because, I mean, lived in this grand palace that's still the presidential palace today. But the Filipino administration had hired Douglas MacArthur out of retirement from the U.S. military to be their military advisor and help them build up their armed forces. And um, MacArthur and Murphy, both having rather substantial egos, were sort of both viewed themselves as kind of the key American in the Philippines. And uh, when, and, and, but MacArthur is being paid by the Philippine president, Quezon. Um, and so they had this wonderful dust up when the, um, when Quezon and Murphy return from the U.S. after the Philippine Constitution has been ratified and Roosevelt has approved it <clears throat> to decide how they should be greeted in Manila and who should get a 21-gun salute. And Murphy said, you know, I'm guiding these people to independence and I want them to be independent, but the U.S. is still the ultimate sovereign authority over the Philippines until that Independence Day. And MacArthur is backing Quezon who said, no, 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 but I'm now president under our constitution. And so even though we're technically not independent yet, I should get the 21 gun salute. And Roosevelt actually had to compromise and say, no, you're both gonna get 19 gun salutes. And so, uh, but he, he always had fond memories of his work in the Philippines, really loved it. And I think um, my impression is, is still highly respected there today for the, the respect he gave the Philippine people and the, the active effort he made to protect their interests as, as, their, as the U.S. representative and to push for independence. So after the storied years, really, in the Philippines, he comes back to Michigan, he runs for governor, he becomes governor. These are in the later years of the Depression now, or midway through. How would you grade his performance as governor of Michigan? Um, it was only a two-year term, so so you and and it was completely marked by that the sit-down strikes in Flint. I mean, those those that was an event of national consequence in the growth and emergence of industrial unions in the United States. And 
So it overshadowed everything else he did. He was, uh, he was not a, a brilliant administrator. He was, um, he, he brought in talented people to work with him, um, but his own work habits were sleep late. He would party a lot and he would come into the office late, um, but he respected talent. So there's a little bit of a best and brightest association with him. Um, he was, he had a, a rep, rep, represent, he was, from his time on the recorder's court, well, he had a big ego and he loved to showboat and grandstand. He was also viewed as incorruptible. And, um, you know, in, in the world of hearsay, I had a delightful conversation with Michigan's longest serving attorney general, Frank Kelly, who, um, whose father ran a saloon in Detroit and was a big Murphy fan. Um, and Frank Kelly recalled as a, as a boy um, he said, every, every Catholic mama dreamed of her son becoming Frank Murphy. And, but he said that when Murphy became governor and he, he defeated the Republican incumbent Frank Fitzgerald, uh, the gambling interest in Detroit had been paying Fitzgerald $50,000 a year. And they went to Murphy and he said, nope, not going to take it. And so it wasn't only backlash against the UAW. There may have been some other factors at work um, helping Murphy, helping Fitzgerald then come back two years later with Murphy weakened in the public perception by the strike. I mean, I think history has said Murphy handled it well, even though he tilted the balance toward labor and allowed the UAW to win recognition from GM. He also won averted what would have been certain bloodshed had the National Guard stormed the General Motors plant and might have scarred labor relations for generations and cost many lives. And so um, history, I think, has said he handled it adroitly, but the immediate public reaction to this idea of, of a small group of workers seizing a plant um, particularly when people are thinking about communism and, and there are communist elements in the unions did not sit well with a lot of voters. Um, but uh, Fitzgerald also from a Grand Rapids angle, this was in the heyday of Frank McKay's influence in the Republican party. And of course, Frank McKay was um, the opposite of incorruptible and probably those gambling interests and McKay both had great interest in seeing Fitzgerald restored to the governorship to serve a lot of interests that Murphy had been unwilling to serve. Fascinating. So uh, he, he does try to run for governor again, correct? But he loses? He loses re-election in 1938. So that's the fall of 1938. And um, <clears throat> and has be, has is has been a just a strong devoted supporter of Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, when the New Deal came in, it was really it it was it was so much like the kind of effort to revive the economy and and rebuild people's lives that he had seen himself doing in Detroit. Um, his budget direct his his comptroller in Detroit was, and, and probably a sagacious appointment on his part, was Hall Roosevelt, Eleanor's brother. And so early on in Detroit, he had uh, uh, close ties with the Roosevelt family. And then his budget director in Lansing when he was governor was the University of Michigan uh, graduate named Harold Smith, who went on to be Roosevelt's budget director. And one of the great figures behind the scenes in the New Deal, in, in the economics of the New Deal. And so he had just built these close ties with Roosevelt. Um, and so uh, Roosevelt is shaking up his cabinet and puts Murphy in as attorney general then in 1939, a few months after he loses reelection. So these close ties with Roosevelt sort of save his bacon in a way because he has some place to go after he loses the election, re-election to governor of Michigan. And then he, in Washington, he's closer. And this is right after the court packing scheme. 
that Roosevelt goes through and is roundly criticized even by Democrats in his own party. Tell us a little bit. I mean, FDR must have had to pick Murphy in a really careful way. I mean, he must have, uh, have assessed that Murphy would uh, be a successful nominee. I think you mentioned earlier that uh, he, he really kind of sailed through the process, uh, the Senate confirmation process. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, he was, of course, you're right with the court packing. That's back in 1937 when, when Roosevelt found so many of his New Deal initiatives being challenged in court and being found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court as it was then constituted. And so, of course, he comes up with his elaborate plan to, to add more justices for every justice over the age of 70, was it? And, and it was viewed as an attempt to pack the court with his allies. And um, not only Republicans, but many Democrats saw that as just unforgivable, an unforgivable attempt to tamper with the Constitution. And so the, that was roundly rejected. But then, um, of course, Roosevelt was in office for so long, the, 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 there were opportunities to replace some of the justices. And um, he had some high profile appointments like Felix Frankfurter and the Harvard Law Professor and Hugo Black, who was a senator from Alabama. And, um, and so the court, he was already beginning to, to see his own supporters go in the court. Um, William O. Douglas, Justice Douglas, and then uh, Murphy after that. Um, in Murphy's case, however, the, he was attorney general for a year, as I mentioned, um, and so uh, working closely with J. Edgar Hoover, um, about whom it must be said, both of them had similar domestic arrangements. And um, one of my great hopes so far, completely unsatisfied, running into dead ends, is to find whatever files secret files Hoover had on Murphy, because he had to have had them because of Murphy's work with the unions back in Michigan, with his, his tolerance of, 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 of left-wing activities in Michigan. Uh, there had to be some great files, but I haven't found any. But they, were, they, they actually were both godparents of one of Evelyn Walsh McLean's grandchildren. So uh, they had an unusual kind of friendly relationship. Um, and in 1939, uh, speculation was rampant about will Roosevelt run for that third term, that you know, breaking the two-term tradition of American presidential politics. And Murphy was very much hoping that Roosevelt would run and that he might be chosen as Roosevelt's vice presidential candidate because Roosevelt was, uh, what did he have, three vice presidents in his, uh, during his tenure in office um, and was indeed, by all accounts, on Roosevelt's short list of three or four people to, to choose for vice president before he settled on Henry Wallace in 19, uh, for 1940. And then um, the but Murphy very much loved to be in the center of the action. And so in his case, he really, um, after Attorney General, he was angling to be Secretary of War. Or to, and, and this is an, as, as World War II is breaking out. I mean, this is just before Pearl Harbor, but it's, it's clear that, that a world conflict is coming. And he desperately wanted to have a more active role in the administration. I want to be vice president, secretary of war, uh, something more substantial that I can, I can play an active part in. Um, instead, Roosevelt puts him on the court. And I haven't done enough research to know how deeply he, he w Murphy wished it were otherwise, because here's this tremendous uh, honor, powerful appointment. But in a sense, it's sidelining, sidelining you from the, from the, the political battlefields that you've spent the last couple of decades of your life on. And so that, that's, a, that's a mixed bag. And he goes on the court realizing that, you know, he's on this recorder's court back, you know, uh, 20 years earlier in Detroit, a small, the local court, but he really doesn't have much judicial experience. He doesn't have a, a background in legal scholarship. Um, he's completely intimidated by the somebody like Felix Frankfurter, the Harvard law professor who knew everybody and told everybody what to do, including Roosevelt. Um, 
he found himself early on as a Frankfurter ally, this, and, and they were they were Roosevelt justices, and then as a, an ally of Hugo Black. Uh, Black was probably his closest thing to a mentor or a, or a, someone he would defer to on the court. Um, there's an argument that. It, Professionally speaking, the, the Murphy's tenure on the court hasn't been viewed as one of the, the great judgeships. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but partly he, he wasn't patient with the kind of close legal scholarship that, a, that a, and certainly a strict constructionist would, would prefer. Uh, and he loved using cases involving civil rights or civil liberties as a platform to evangelize. And that didn't sit well with the court, who liked to think of themselves as sort of being above the political fray. Um, and so, and he, uh, he didn't sit down and drink with the other justices at the same time that he is this eligible bachelor as he's described and so he's much in demand and readily accepting invitations on the Washington social circuit which also struck some of the justices as not terribly suited for someone in the black robe. So all these things uh, uh, were unsettling to some of his fellow justices on the court. And yet he does become famous for a very controversial dissent. And that's he going to be in the early 40s. Tell us about that. Yes, indeed. After Pearl Harbor, and this is December of 1941, in 1942, the Army General in charge of defenses on the west coast of America urges President Roosevelt uh, uh, to think about the potential threat of sabotage coming from Japanese Americans who live on the West Coast, and I mean, where most Japanese Americans then live. And the, there was this great fear that um, if you were a Japanese, even though you're hyphenated Japanese, of Amer Japanese American, somehow you may be harboring sympathies for the Japanese emperor and would come to the aid of Japanese attacking the US. And so he, the Roosevelt and Secretary of War Henry Stimson approve a plan to intern Japanese Americans in camps. Concentration camp seems a harsh word now in terms of our subsequent World War II experience, but uh, to, to move tens of thousands of Japanese Americans from Washington and Oregon and California inland to camps where they would be contained for the rest of the war. And the uh, attorneys representing some of the Japanese Americans challenged the constitutionality of depriving American citizens of their rights that way. Case goes to the Supreme Court. The most famous of those cases is Korematsu, Fred Korematsu, uh, who challenged that. And the court by a 6-3 vote upheld Roosevelt's wartime powers to make that executive order. But Murphy wrote uh, there were three dissenters, but Murphy wrote the most famous and influential dissent in that case, using the term racism for the first time, as best we can tell, before the Supreme Court, to say that this is a gross violation of the rights of American citizens and an abhorrent act. And um, that, that dissent has come to be seen, that the action of interning Japanese Americans has come to be seen as one of the gross civil liberties uh, travesties in American history, and Murphy has the clearest, most eloquent expression of why that should not have occurred. And Hank, you heard a really interesting story. Please tell viewers the Justice Kennedy story about the boy he befriended in California, uh, this boy who was affected by Korematsu. Well, this is, this is also believes this is also how you trap, get trapped into feeling like you need to write a biography sometimes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm on the, the board of the National Constitution Center and um, one of my colleagues and I arrived early for a meeting last fall where the National Constitution Center presents a medal called the, the, the Liberty Medal every year to a, to a worthy recipient. And um, last year's award winner was um, 
retired Justice Anthony Kennedy. And so um, I arrived early for our, our meeting after which the, the award ceremony was to take place. And, and the, um, we got to the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia and the, um, one of the staffers said to uh, a couple of us, well, if you'd like to join the director, he's uh, Jeff Rosen, he's showing uh, Justice Kennedy through the exhibit. And we said, well, sure, we'd love to, you know, tag along and listen to their conversation. So the director of the National Constitution Center is introducing us to Justice Kennedy. And he said, well, this is Hank Meyer. And he's going to be writing a biography of Frank Murphy. Now, we had had a very brief conversation about this. Um, and so, uh-oh, I'm trapped. And of course, Kennedy starts saying, well, oh, didn't he do this case? And didn't he write this majority opinion? And didn't he do this? And I said, I'm just starting this. But then he proceeded to tell a story about as a young man, Justice Kennedy, who's now 83, 84 years old, grew up in Sacramento. And his best friend was a little Japanese American boy. This is when they're six or seven years old in the early 1940s. And they would play at each other's houses. And he said, I would go to my friend's house and his favorite toy, his most cherished possession was this samurai warrior in a glass case. He said, we couldn't actually play with it. We couldn't take it out of the case, but we would play around that case. And one day in, this would be 1940, late 42, early 43, his little friend comes to Justice Kennedy's house, comes to the door and gives him this samurai soldier to look after because this little boy and his family are being removed to one of the internment camps. And so here for Justice Kennedy, I, I, you know, who was, I think, a great Supreme Court judge, um, this is still a vivid memory of what it was like to have your, your best boyhood pal taken away by a government decision uh, approved by the Supreme Court. And so for him, that, that moment is still so alive and it makes you appreciate the, the, the dissenting opinion of Murphy and how, how really important that is in our history. That's a really poignant story. Very powerful. You said that, uh, that Justice Murphy died quite young. He was 59 years old. What did he die of? He, he had a heart condition. And so um, I'm, I'm not entirely clear of the immediate cause of death, but he had been in and out of Henry Ford Hospital um, in his last term as judge. He had had some, some illness challenges, but um, uh, it was, I, I think it was uh, hemorrhage ultimately. Um, again, I haven't seen the hospital records. I've got so much to learn about this, but, um, but yes, he died. Uh, died very young um, uh, at a time, it'd be just much too young. Is, is there a house or a place in Detroit where you can visit where Frank Murphy lived? Not in Detroit, but the, I, I had made plans last month to go over to Harbor Beach in the Thumb where there is the Frank Murphy Boyhood Home and Museum that his, um, some of his family members took pains to preserve and, um, and it is a, a museum open by appointment um, primarily in the summertime but um, like everything else it is temporarily off limits and so I don't have a chance to go there yet but okay. um, very much looking forward to that. We're gonna have to have you back on you can give us a report. <laughs> well <laughs> you'll have to have me on when I know something we're just in the, <laughs> the earliest stages of, of knowledge gathering here. Hank why should Michiganders and why should Americans remember Frank Murphy? I, I think um, you, we, 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 there are characters worth celebrating, and I found this in a different way with Arthur Vandenberg, who, who, are, who come from among us and who are right in our own backyards, who leave their imprint on the state, the nation, the world. And um, in, in Vandenberg's case, he he drew public opinion with him. He, he, made a, he made his own evolution that reflected an evolution from, from inward looking isolationism to America's role as a global leader. 
and, and in making his own transition, pulled public opinion with him, pulled um, a lot of sentiment in Congress with him. Murphy didn't have that kind of effect. Murphy didn't undergo that kind of transformation. He was often the solo dissenter on the Supreme Court. He was the outspoken mayor of Detroit, the, the mediator, but also out on a limb character in the sit-down strike in, uh, as governor. Um, and, but always with a passion for the underprivileged, for people he saw as, as oppressed or uh, particularly for minorities. A lot of his Supreme Court cases had to do with religious liberty um, and, and fighting for people who actually, I mean, he was a devout Catholic. Um, you know, many people thought he should have been a priest, uh, but he, he, he defended the rights of Jehovah Witnesses who had been caustic critics, critics of Catholicism um, when some of their liberties and some of their practices were challenged. And so he just saw, he was, he had this sort of wonderful, almost naive, but I think really noble notion of democracy as this living thing that had to be sustained by sort of rising to, uh, I mean, to use the, the familiar Lincoln cliche, rising to our better angels, saying, no, these Japanese Americans are Americans. No, these Jehovah's Witnesses are citizens with rights. The, the, he cultivated the African American vote in Detroit. And I, I, as, I, as we're talking, I'm thinking, um, this is in the 1920s, and I wonder how many politicians in America were viewing African Americans as people who, who's, who could be your allies in major political undertakings. And he won the respect of, he was, he was on the NAACP board, he won the respect of early civil rights leaders for bringing people into the mainstream who had, who had been marginalized and for protecting people who are at risk of marginalization. And I think that's, that, that, there's, a, there's a sort of nobility of purpose there that um, combined with the fact that he was a very colorful character uh, makes his story worth telling. That's just a, a wonderful story. You mentioned Sidney Fine there at the University of Michigan History Department. Is if viewers want to view an article or a read a book before your book comes out, what would you recommend? What's your favorite? Well, Sidney was a dear man, but one of the reasons there may be room for a biography is that his biography of Frank Murphy is three volumes, about fifteen hundred pages. It is very dense reading. Um, there was actually, and it, it appeared, those three volumes appeared throughout the 1970s, basically. Um, in 1968, a constitutional historian from Johns Hopkins named J. Woodson Howard um, published a biography called Justice Murphy, um, and it's really terrific. I mean, it is a very, it's very insightful, weighs Murphy's reputation very carefully, um, it's a wonderful book and almost intimidates another would-be biographer, except that it too runs to about 500 pages and goes blow by blow through the nuances of so many of Murphy's court cases that um, it's a little, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. And so uh, <clears throat> it is terrific background reading, but I think there's room for something half that long that can try to, to balance his early years. And there's a separate, there's another book by a fellow named Lunt on, on his, called The High Ministry of, of Government about Murphy's years in, in Detroit and Lansing. Um, <clears throat> each of those is insightful in its way, but there's room for something that is, that, that follows the narrative of someone whose commitment to civil rights and civil liberties was unwavering from his youth um, and uh, covers those Supreme Court years, but not, but but maybe in in a little less detail, so that more people might find time to read it. 
Well, Hank, we have viewers who are queued up to ask a few questions, so let's bring them into our conversation. Uh, one person asks, uh, and maybe you just answered it, but why don't we know more about this champion of civil rights and a person who had such political courage and judicial courage to go against the grain? Why, why don't we know more about him? <clears throat> I think the one, one ironic problem could be a biography so massive that it, nobody else has decided to, it was worth writing about him. And so um, a couple of generations go by and, and he slips from memory. I think he, because on the court, he was viewed as, so, as a little bit of a lightweight that uh, Felix Frankfurter and Hugo Black were the dominant characters of that Roosevelt wing of the court. And, um, and Murphy was sometimes drawn along in their wake or sometimes challenged by them um, in his close legal reasoning um, that the, both the, the sort of the judiciary and even maybe the the bar in a greater sense of attorneys generally specialists in the field don't see him as one of them he was just he was maybe a little too a little too eager and sloppy and preachy and quick to fire off his opinion um, in what he saw as righteous causes and history has vindicated the righteousness of a lot of his opinions but they 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 didn't sort of pass critical muster. They, in, in some of the argument was that they were sort of aimed over the heads of the fellow justices to reach a wider public, and it's like you know, sort of don't go there. It's almost like maybe maybe academic historians looking down on popular historians because um, because they're not writing for the academy. I think some of the justices would have said he well he's not writing he's not writing for us. He's writing to to reach these masses of people out there. And um, now I think we've seen the court become more accessible and more visible. Um, and you wonder today when you, when you see that how, how Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, uh, is um, viewed as such an outspoken uh, champion and a popular figure, I could almost imagine today Murphy having that kind of following where people aren't paying rigorous attention to his to his his legal arguments or uh, worrying about how much the clerk wrote and how much he wrote but they're saying you know he speaks the way we feel and um i think that 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 didn't happen during his lifetime we have another viewer who asks they just want to know is for you as a researcher what's the most surprising thing that you've learned about murphy in this process I haven't learned enough to be too surprised yet. I would say the, the surprising, not in a profound way, but I mentioned his, his, his relationship with Evelyn Walsh McLean. And the story goes that when she was, she was dying and she died in 1947, so a couple of years before he did, he was summoned to her mansion in Washington. He was a close friend and executor of the estate. And after she, the night she died, um, one of her servants hands him her bag of diamonds from her safe. Now this includes the Hope Diamond. And he doesn't know what to do with it. And he ends up riding in a cab for hours around Washington DC until the Riggs National Bank opens in the morning. And it's rather challenges any stereotype we could possibly have of a Supreme Court justice driving around waiting for the bank to open <laughs> to deposit um, maybe the most significant jewelry collection in the country. What a story. Patrick asks, was there any acknowledgement from the Japanese American community for Justice Murphy's stance on his dissent? Good question. I, I mean, he, he, in that, what the Korematsu was not his only uh, opinion. There were a couple of other similar cases as well. Um, but in terms of official recognition, I don't know. I, I'm, I, that's a great question. I got to find out. Another viewer asks, what lesson in leadership can, say, students in our Cook Leadership Academy and other young people take from Murphy? I mean, what do you admire most about him as a leader? Uh, in his case, he was not an organization man. 
So the, some of the great um, leadership lessons that we might take that we would apply in a lot of settings. I mean, in, in, in my business life, for example, um, charisma is great, but you've got to be able to um, pull other people into collaboration with you um, to be a great leader. So, you know, we don't think of, of General Marshall, you know, one of Colonel Hauenstein's uh, revered figures. We don't think of General Marshall or, or, uh, or even General Eisenhower. They're not a personality cult. They were, they were working with difficult characters to bring them together to achieve great ends. Um, Murphy was not, um, didn't have that disposition in, in his leadership dependent on his passion. Passion and well, and one other uh, very important uh, trait, and that would be empathy. And I mean, here in our in our current situation, I hadn't thought about this until the until Patrick asked it. Um, that capacity for empathy is something that struck people, and so he could go to the the grandest um, society affairs in Washington D.C. and fight for the the weakest among us in his day job and find friends in both places. And um, so I would say he, his career is a testament to how far passion can take you. And his, his, the leadership quality that joined with that um, when he was at his most effective would have been empathy. And based on your research so far, how do you think Murphy would respond to the current pandemic? He, well, certainly, um, despite his early attempts to balance the budget in the city of Detroit, he would have recognized the, the, the need to support, I mean, particularly the urban centers, and we're thinking of, of, of New York, New Orleans, Detroit, that were, have been so hard hit. He would have said, the federal government has a role to play here, and we've got to step in where we can and make sure there are the supplies and the assistance that are required for, for hospitals, for small businesses. Um, one, of his, one of his sort of side legacies was um, today there is an organization called the, what is it called, the United States Conference of Mayors. The, as I understand it, Murphy basically organized the original conference of mayors in 1932 when as mayor of Detroit, he recognized that the, the depression, the effects of the depression on the city were so severe that it was beyond the scope of the city itself. It didn't have enough resources to deal with this. And, and there were, there were you know, side issues like you know, the Henry Ford plant where people are being laid off is in Dearborn. They're paying taxes in Dearborn, not in Detroit. He's seeing his tax revenues dwindle um, with people who work in these plants that are in other places outside the city limits of Detroit. The problem was bigger than one municipality. Um, the governor didn't, in, the Michigan governor didn't have the, the, the same kind of commitment and um, the legislature was not inclined to help Detroit and so he said, you know, this is just too big for, for us mayors to handle. We need to have a relationship with the federal government and get the attention of the federal government, get the resources of the federal government if our cities are going to survive. And uh, so he calls the U.S. Conference of Mayors, convenes it in Washington. Um, and it's been, I think, flourishing to some degree ever since. But that was uh, it's another Murphy legacy. You know, I have a personal question. Just looking at your background there, are you going to write this book on Frank Murphy in that room in your library? Uh, I certainly hope to write parts of it there. I, I, I uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I haven't thought of it in those terms, but that's where it starts. You betcha. Kind of the Brian Lamb question from C-SPAN. <laughs> that's right. Well, Hank, is there anything else you would like to mention that we haven't covered? Oh my gosh. Um, well, this is, if, if anybody has any Murphy anecdotes they'd like to share, because I'm, I'm sending this out and when Gleaves is asking me good questions that I can't, I can't begin to answer some of them. Um, but I think the, um, I guess I'd, I'm, 
I'm trying to understand, and, and, and the, the question about leadership was a good one, um, what it is that, um, that, that helps someone, well, one of, one of the things that, um, one of the challenges for Murphy, Franklin Roosevelt said he ought to get married if he wanted to have a political future. And <laughs> the, there was also the, the general assumption today that, that, he was, uh, that he was gay. And that also may have made some of his relationships a little trickier with some of his fellow justices. And it may have added to his sense of empathy for minorities and for people who felt marginalized. And so um, I'd really like to have a better understanding of that, of how that may have played in his outlook and in his, um, both, in, in both in people's reactions to him and in his own devotion to ideas of tolerance that were often ahead of his time. Thank you, Hank, for sharing your passion for research and for writing and telling us about the most interesting Michigander that many of us probably don't know very much about. Uh, the people who've tuned in can now see why you're such an esteemed scholar of ours at the Howenstein Center. Thanks also to our viewers whom I invite to zoom in or join us on Facebook at the same time, Thursday, April 30th, when my guest will be Connor Cavallero. Just this past Friday, Connor graduated from GVSU and from our Howenstein Center's Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. He will share his leadership journey with us and especially what he learned while recently studying abroad in Italy. Till Thursday at 1 p.m., stay tuned and stay well.